Welcome to the Consumer Finance Podcast. I'm Chris Willis, the co-leader of Trotman Pepper's Consumer Financial Services Regulatory Practice. And today we're going to be talking about a recent CFPB advisory opinion on time board debt or maybe mortgage debt. We'll see once we get into the discussion. But before we jump into that topic, let me remind you to visit and subscribe to our blog, ConsumerFinancialServicesLawMonitor.com, where you'll see all the updates we post about what's going on in the consumer financial services universe. And don't forget to check out our other podcasts. We have lots of them. We have the FCRA Focus, all about credit reporting, the Crypto Exchange, about all things crypto, and Unauthorized Access, which is our data security and privacy podcast. And all of those are available on popular podcast platforms. And speaking of those platforms, if you like this podcast, let us know. Leave us a review on your podcast platform of choice and let us know how we're doing. Now, as I said, today we're going to be talking about a recent CFPB advisory opinion that talked about the collection of what the CFPB termed as zombie mortgages that were barred by the statute of limitations. And I have three of my colleagues on to talk with me about this today and to share their insights with you, the audience, about it. Two of them have been on the podcast before, Stephanie Jackman and Jonathan Floyd. And then we have a new partner to welcome today, Joe Riley, who's just joined our firm. He's in our Washington, D.C. office, and he is our resident expert on a lot of things, one of them being mortgage lending. Jonathan, Stephanie, Joe, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for having us, Chris. Yes, thank you very much, Chris. What prompted this episode was that the CFPB came out with another of its sort of strongly worded advisory opinions cautioning debt collectors and others about collecting on time-barred mortgage debt. And so, Stephanie, can you just like set the stage for the audience and tell us like, what is this advisory opinion about? Yeah, I'm happy to. Last month in April, the CFPB came out with an advisory opinion that I read as reminding us that there are aged second mortgages the CFPB said a lot of them were packaged up and sold after the last financial crisis of 2008 and 9, and the CFPB is expressing concern that some of those may still be percolating, maybe time barred, maybe as you noted, Chris, in a zombie status, and taking the opportunity to remind all of us that there are restrictions and things we need to be careful about when collecting on age debt that is time barred under state law. Okay, so we'll get into the specifics of the advisory opinion in a minute. But Joe, let me turn to you. You have so much background in the mortgage industry. And in fact, Joe is the author of a very popular American Bankers Association desk book on the CFPB's mortgage origination rules. So we're very lucky to have him for his mortgage expertise, among other expertise that he has. But Joe, can you give the audience a little bit of background about what was going on with second mortgages dating back to before the CFPB's inception of like 2006, 7, before the recession of 2008? Thanks, Chris. Yes, the background for this advisory opinion does go back to the years prior to the Great Recession when mortgage underwriting standards were not what they are today. They were more lax. And it was not uncommon for mortgage borrowers to put zero money down on a home purchase. They would finance the purchase with two loans, a first lien mortgage for about 80% of the purchase price, and then a second lien mortgage for the balance, the balance being you know, approximately 20%. Those second lien loans were often referred to as piggyback loans. As real estate prices then declined in the 2005, 2006, 2007 period, those second lien loans in particular became practically uncollectible. Mortgage borrowers as the value of the home went down, became what people would call underwater, meaning the value of the home was less than the size of the debt. And that would be particularly true for the second lien holder who only collects in a foreclosure sale once the first lien holder has collected in full. So a lot of holders of these second lien loans effectively gave up any hope of ever collecting on them and did disappear from the market, ceased communications with borrowers, charged the loans off, and in many cases, sold the loans to debt buyers for much less than 100 cents on the dollar. The hook for the CFPB's announcement appears to be some press reports that in more recent years, some of the holders of these second lien loans have resurfaced after an absence of communication with the borrower for a decade or more, and these second lien holders are attempting to collect on the debt. I would just point out it's rather common for us to see the CFPB pointing to 
the Great Recession or events prior to the Great Recession as a hook for an advisory opinion, since the Great Recession, after all, is what drove the creation of the CFPB. But I think overall, the story I just told, the history I just described, is really just the hook for a much broader point that the CFPB wants to make about time-barred debt. And we'll hear more on that from Stephanie and Jonathan. Thanks a lot, Joe, for that background. With that, Jonathan, can you just now dive a little further into the specific things that the CFPB is using this advisory opinion to warn the market about and highlight the point that Joe made, which is, is this really specific to mortgage or not? What I will point out is, although this is an advisory opinion, it really doesn't change anything. It's really just highlighting a point that the CFPB wants to make. Regulation F already confirmed for us that a debt collector must not bring or threaten to bring a legal action against a consumer to collect a time bar debt. What we've seen here, though, is the CFPB has found a very specific example of something they don't like, and then they've used that almost as a marketing purpose to remind everyone about this rule, but also to put out something that is, you know, they're following the press cycle. They're seeing what's in the news, and we're seeing advisory opinions like this all on that issue. So although they've used these second mortgages as an example of this, this is a widespread advisory opinion that touches anyone who may be a debt collector under the FDCPA. It's not limited just to the mortgage situations, which Joe just described to us. And further, although it's not directly referenced in the body of the advisory opinion itself, the word zombie death is included in a footnote. They make reference to an Associated Press article within the advisory opinion, and then the press release that goes with it talks a lot about this zombie debt, even though this isn't technically zombie debt. But yes, this is the CFPB, what I would consider being more aggressive in essentially marketing efforts here. Very interesting insight, Jonathan. Thank you for that. Stephanie, I want to give you an opportunity to come back and tell the audience what you think some of the points of significance or takeaways from this advisory opinion are. Jonathan makes some really good points about what it's doing, what it's not doing, but some things to remember. First, yes, debt collectors that are subject to the FDCPA are squarely subject to and within the scope of the advisory opinion, FDCPA case law, et cetera. But remember, number one, it's not limited just to debt collectors. The FDCPA is, but the CFPB has put out previously Bulletin 2013-07, where it said it would apply a non-exclusive list of FDCPA requirements to creditors collecting their own debt through UDAP. Then the CFPB in Reg F, both in the proposed rule and then in finalizing it, the CFPB made remarks about finding the efforts or threats, if you will, to collect on time bar debt to be something they think is an unfair practice. That's the U and UDAP. So they're telegraphing right there. It's not much of a leap. There are some state laws also that come into play here that can impact creditors. First, you have Mississippi and Wisconsin. And if it's purchased debt, North Carolina, that prohibit any type of collection activity on a time bar debt, there's no exception for a mortgage or a certain type of debt. If it's past the date of the statute of limitations under that applicable law, it's as if that debt never came into existence and it's not collectible. Other states require disclosures, and some of those are applicable to creditors in collection communications. So that's the first thing to think about. This isn't just a defaulted debt collector issue. The CFPB reminded us on page six that even if you're doing just a non-judicial foreclosure, like something that's allowed here in Georgia, where I live, you're still subject to the provision of the FDCPA and then any state analogs that apply more broadly to my prior point, section 1692 F6, that say you can't threaten to take an action that you don't have a legal right to do. So you can't threaten to sue on an account where it's time barred. That's an interesting when you start thinking about it in the mortgage context, because if the consumer is still in possession of the property, right, are they getting to keep security for a loan? It can get tricky, but it's something to think about and discuss with counsel. CFPB also put basically a roadmap of all the ways consumers can attack efforts to collect, even if done in a way that doesn't threaten legal action that is not allowed because it's time barred a roadmap of ways to bring litigation. 
They reminded everybody of all the other sections of the FDCPA that can apply, dealing with you can't make false statements, you need to answer questions accurately, you have to deal with disputes and a whole host of other sections that could fit to certain activity. They reminded everybody this is strict liability, that we don't get a mulligan, if you will. Whether that's fair or not to creditors and collectors is a different discussion, but the reality is it's a strict liability standard, especially under Reg F. If the debt is time barred, you may not threaten to sue or try to sue on it or take legal action on it. Oh, and by the way, the CFPB was clear to say one more thing that consumers should recognize may have been done wrong over the last decade or whatever while these loans have been sitting there aging is whether or not the servicers, if they qualify as mortgage servicers, have been providing monthly periodic statements because RESPA and the CFPB's mortgage servicing rules may apply. So I read it as just a whole host of ways to make it difficult if you are actually an owner or servicer of some of these really aged second mortgages to do anything about them. Stephanie, thanks for that. It sounds like there's a lot packed into this advisory opinion in the way of reminders, a lot of which is applicable to all kinds of debt, not just these second mortgages. But Jonathan, let me turn to you. What do you think the practical takeaways for the industry are writ large from the advisory opinion? Chris, I think some of the practical takeaways are when communicating with consumers about older debt, very likely debt collectors should be prepared for one, consumers have no idea what they're talking about, which leads to a high percentage of requests for validation, which leads to disputes, which ultimately could lead to litigation. And we've even seen litigation in this context, even when debt collectors have done the right thing. You know, there's famously a case out of the Seventh Circuit where the debt collector used the time bar debt language, but they used it in a letter that also included an offer to settle the account. And the consumer filed a lawsuit saying the use of the word settle made me think about lawsuits, but your letter said the debt was time barred. So I'm confused. And the Seventh Circuit upheld that. And the entity who had been sued there was under a consent decree, they said, well, this is what we agreed to say for time bar debt language in our consent decree. The Seventh Circuit said, that may be good enough for your consent decree, but that's not good enough for us. So debt collectors should be prepared. The CFPB has put a target on your back, particularly as it relates to this type of debt. And anytime you're communicating with consumers about older debts, be prepared. Disputes are going to be high. Validation requests are going to be high. And litigation is going to be more likely from your efforts. I think those are really great points, Jonathan. I don't have anything else to add. It's just the time for caution and attention to these issues. And the CFPB is kindly reminding us if we weren't already thinking about it. We have been suitably warned then. So Joe, Jonathan, Stephanie, thanks for being on the podcast today. And thanks, of course, to our listeners for tuning in as well. Don't forget to visit our blog, consumerfinancialservicesLawMonitor.com, and hit that subscribe button so that you can get all of the updates about the daily posts we give about the consumer financial services industry and all of its legal happenings. And while you're at it, why don't you head on over to Troutman.com and add yourself to our consumer financial services email list. That way you'll get notice of our industry-only webinars and copies of the alerts that we send out. And of course, stay tuned for a great new episode of this podcast every Thursday afternoon or sometimes more frequently if we have something special to tell you about. Thank you all for listening. Copyright Troutman Pepper Hamilton Sanders LLP. These recorded materials are designed for educational purposes only. This podcast is not legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individual participants. Troutman Pepper does not make any representations or warranties, express or implied, regarding the contents of this podcast. Information on previous case results does not guarantee a similar future result. Users of this podcast may save and use the podcast only for personal or other non-commercial educational purposes. No other use, including, without limitation, reproduction, retransmission or editing of this podcast may be made without the prior written permission of Troutman Pepper. If you have any questions, please contact us at Troutman.com.